is essentially something that's very popular right now. And it says, controlling the tongue isn't my issue. It's my face that needs deliverance. All right. So, so like, just thinking about this for a minute, okay? Thinking about this for a minute. Now, I know that we're talking about the tongue this morning. But, you know, how many of us have had to bite our tongue and keep ourselves from saying something that we shouldn't say? Now, unfortunately... A lot of times when this happens, you don't have a mirror to look in to see what your face looks like, all right? And sometimes, sometimes you may be saying something or not saying something, but your face is definitely saying something, all right? And so essentially what I'm trying to get at with that this morning is that, that some of us, all right, some people that we encounter, some moments that we come up to because of the things that are dwelling in our heart that we want to verbally say, but we're trying to keep it quiet just makes us ugly. Wow, (laughs) that's awful, but seriously, like, I've been there. I've been in situations before where someone has looked at me perplexed, and they're like, do you have something to say? You know, and then you're just like holding your breath. You're like, okay, I can do this. I can do this. And, and the point, though, is this, okay, that when you, when you are trying to drive a statement or a phrase or something you want to say so far deep back within your heart that it causes you to look outwardly pained, there is something within you that's trying to make an escape. There's something that lives within you that needs to be addressed. There's something that you have got to deal with. Now, let me say it like this. There's a voice behind our tongue, and it's, it's a voice that speaks the language of our heart, okay? So everything that we say, everything that we speak, you know, the, the voice, there's a voice behind the tongue. There's a voice behind the tongue, and that voice is a language that is native to what's going on in our heart. That voice is a language that is spoken from our heart. Now, it's up to us and how we experience God and how we experience Jesus, and how we consider the gospel, and how we consider the Bible, and how we allow it to affect our hearts that determine what language we're speaking. Are we speaking the language of the dead? Are we speaking the language of life? Are we speaking the language of lies, or are we speaking the language of truth? Are we speaking the language of despair or the language of hope? It depends on what exists within us. It depends on what is going on inside of our hearts. Now, in Matthew 15, Jesus is taking some issue, okay? The the Pharisees and Sadducees are concerned about hand-washing ceremony, and they're worried about the disciples not following through because they're not cleaning themselves properly before they ate. They were so adamant about the laws that if any of them, even the process of washing your hands was affected, they considered that person unclean, impure. And so this is what Jesus begins to say, and this is in the Passion Translation. He says, frauds and hypocrites. Isaiah described you perfectly when he said, these people honor only, me only with their words, for their hearts are so very distant from me. They pretend to worship me, but their worship is nothing more than empty traditions of men. And then Jesus turned to the crowd and he said this, Come, listen and open your heart to understand. What truly contaminates a person is not what he puts into his mouth, but what comes out of his mouth. That's what makes people defiled. When his disciples approached him and said, Uh, don't you know that what you just said offended the Pharisees? And Jesus replied, every plant that my heavenly father didn't plant is destined to be uprooted. Stay away from them. And for, for they're nothing more than blind guides. Do you know what happens when the blind man pretends to guide another blind man? They both stumble into a ditch. Peter spoke up and said, will you explain to us what you mean by your parable? Okay, you know, I know sometimes the most simple things are the hardest things. All right, no, no shots against Peter because my wife says things and I say, can you explain what you, anyway. Um, Jesus said this, even after all that I've taught you, you still remain clueless? Okay, 
Thanks, Jesus. Uh, it is hard to understand that whatever you eat enters the stomach only to pass out into the sewer. But what comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. Words can, complute, can pollute, not food. You will find living within an impure heart, evil ideas, murderous thoughts, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, lies, and slander. That's what pollutes a person. Eating with unwashed hands doesn't defile anything. Doesn't defile anything. So, there, I mean, there's so much going on here. Just referencing verse 8 for a minute, though. Um, in the Passion Translation, he says, These people honor me only with their words, for their hearts are so very distant from me. He's addressing the heart. He's getting to the heart of the issue. He's beginning to see and, and point out the fact. I mean, these guys were eloquent. These guys knew things. They knew the law. They were taught the law. They followed everything very specifically. They followed everything very clearly. They made sure that what they did outwardly reflected what they were learning. But we find out in this, in, in Jesus' interactions with them, we find out with Jesus' moments with them, and he begins, to, he begins to point out the fact that there's something else going on within. There's a very real issue inside of them, and that very real issue is the fact that they give lip service, that they say things, they say things, but their hearts are distant. They say things, but their hearts are distant, meaning that the words that they speak, the words that they say, the things that flow out of their mouth are an indication of what's happening within, even if the things that come out of their mouth appear to be pure, appear to be holy. Yes, we can begin to, in some senses, um, begin to change the way we phrase things. We can, in some sentence, say the right things, but still, it's meaningless. We can say all the right things. We can know the jargon. We can know the terminology. We can know exactly what we think needs to be said, and we can say those things in those moments, but they are worthless because, I mean, when they truly reflect our heart, they only reveal how far we are from God. In verse 18, just referencing that again, Jesus makes the statement, but what comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. Words can, can, can pollute, not food. What comes out of your mouth reveals the core of your heart. The things that are said reveals the core of your heart. Let me phrase it this way. Words, just referencing back to the thought I made earlier, words are the language of the heart. And if it's true that our words are the language of our heart, then we need to be taught a new language, a language that can only be discovered through the transformative truth of the gospel. Okay? Words are the language of our hearts. Words are the vo our words are an indication of what exists within. And if that's true, if that's true, then the words that we say, like I was just mentioning earlier, the words that we say are an indication of what's going on inside of us. It reveals the core of our heart. And if we're going to learn a language that glorifies God, if we're going to learn things that, that find expression in ways that honor his name, that, that declare who he is, that, that have a powerful and significant effect in the right way, the way that brings us closer to Christ and brings other closer to Christ, then we need to learn a language that can only be discovered through the transformative truth of the gospel because the gospel changes our soul. The gospel changes everything within us. The gospel becomes the terminology that we use. The gospel becomes the words that we speak. It's the truth. It's life. It has meaning. It's purpose. You know, we can, we can say some pretty cool things. We can say some pretty nice things. But we've got to understand that everything that we say is attached to something. Everything that comes out of here is an indication of what's going on in here. And I know that, that you know, th this, 
This is something that we hear about a lot. This is something that the Bible speaks of. This is something that Jesus declared and the Proverbs declared and the Psalms declared. But it is so important for us to realize that we need to begin to deal with what's in here if we're going to address what's coming out here. Because you can say things but not mean them. You can say things but not mean them. Listen to this statement, okay, or these statements. You cannot separate your inward voice from your outward voice. You cannot separate your outward voice from your inward voice. It's like this cyclic experience. You can't separate the two. You can't separate your inward voice from your outward voice. The voice that speaks within is going to speak without. The voice that is inside of you is going to speak outside of you. And just as much as the voice that speaks out of, outside of you can, can defile things around you, it turn, in turn defiles you. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Like the things you say affect here. The things that happen here affect what you say. It's like this, this you know, it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You know, that, that your heart is corrupted, your heart is affected, and you just say things, and then those things come back and haunt your soul and affect your heart. And then, and then you know, you, your heart is affected by what you say, and then... And then what you say is affected by your heart. It's this terrible cycle that just continues to move and move and move. And Jesus, you know, continuing in his, his incredible teaching, he, you know, in, in Luke chapter 6, you know, he, he starts to uh, say some things. You know, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, let me see where I'm at. Okay, um, what are you filling your heart with? I'll, I'll read that in a second. What are you filling your heart with? That, that's an important question. Like, what are you feeding this? What are you feeding this? I want to read a scripture in a minute here, but, but let's stick here for a second. What are you allowing to come in here? Because what you allow to come in here can contaminate everything about you. Now, I know we're talking about the tongue, but like I said, if we're going to control the tongue, if we're going to deal with the tongue, or if we're going to deal with what's coming out of our mouth, we've got to deal with what's in our hearts. And what, what goes into our heart? I, I've often heard it said um, that our eyes and ears are a window to our soul. What you see can defile this. What you hear can defile this. What The things that you expose yourself to have a definite power to change everything that's going on within you. I used to talk to youth ministries about this, um, you know, youth kids, and it, and it bears the reflection of what's going on today. I would see kids walking around just feeling broken and depressed and full of anxiety and just feeling so devastated. And I would ask them outright, like, what is the music that you're listening to? What are you listening to right now? Well, you know, I'm listening to this music, and, and one of the common phrases, well, I like the music, not the words. I'm like, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, the words that are being said affect you. And so I would, what I would do is, is they would share some, you know, musical bands or whatever that they were listening to, and I would say, okay, let's, let's look up some of the lyrics. Let's see what they're singing about. Let's see what they're saying. And we would unpack those words, and we begin to talk about those things. Yeah, you feeling that way? Listen to the, the mixtape of your mind. Listen to the things that are being said over you constantly because they're affecting you. You know, if, if you want to be, um, you know, find yourself perverted and affected in a, in a sexual way, then watch things that are going to infect your heart, that are going to affect your heart sexually. I mean, like, what are you allowing to, to, to infiltrate inside of you? I mean, like, like the perversion, the negative, awful things that are said about people, that are said about others, whether um, male or female, can be born of something that we watch, something that we allow ourselves to be engaged with. And we're living in a culture that just totally and completely minimizes this. They, we, we've so desensitized these things. And so... What are you filling your heart with, right? Because whatever is at the core of you comes out of you. Whatever comes out of you is at the core of you. And so let me read a scripture here. Um, Philippians 4, 8 and uh, 9 says this. It says, finally, brothers. This is the Holman Christian Standard Bible. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any moral excellence, and if there is any praise, dwell on these things. 
Do those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. Dwell there. Dwell there. We need to find our, our, our thoughts. We need to find our minds because we know that our minds affect our hearts. Okay? I mean, you, you, they're, not, they're not like entirely different entities, okay? There is this heart, mind, and soul experience that happens at the core of your being. The things that you think about are going to affect the things that you feel. The things that you think about are going to affect your emotions, your expressions, your statements. The, thing that you think, the things that you think about affect your heart. And so, in this text, you know, it, it's talking about all these different things, all these different realities that can, can affect us, okay? So, um, there's so much to unpack here. There's so much to think about here, but whatever is true, Think of the truth. Think about how our lives can be conformed to the truth. Think about the truth that God speaks of. Think about the word. Think about scripture. Think about what Jesus did for you. That truth. That truth that conforms all things, that changes all things. You want to begin to affect what's in your heart? Think about the truth. Okay? Whatever is noble or whatever is honest. You need to dwell on whatever is noble, whatever is honest. You've got to think about those things. You've got to ponder those things. You've got to look at those things. Not vulgar or crude or frivolous or trivial things, but, but noble things. Things that matter. Things that are of value. Things that are special. All right? Not things that you find in the gutter. Whatever is right or whatever is just. All right? I mean, like, like thinking about things that cause you to not mock, things that you think about that cause you to not stand back and say, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to, you know, look at this, this junk that's happening around me and whatever. I don't care, you know. Um, it is what it is. Our world's going to hell in a handbasket, and it's just whatever. You know, I can't do anything about it. I can't address it. No, we got to think about the things that are just. we got to think about the things that are right. When we think about those things, it begins to affect our hearts. We've got to focus on the pure. These guys, these are self-explanatory. We've got we to focus on the pure. We've got to focus on the pure, lovely things. Things that, are, things that are beautiful. You know, when I think of lovely things, I think of the, the lavishness of God's blessings in my life. I think of the things that should captivate our attention when we walk outside and see the sun and see the trees and the mountains. I think about the breeze that hits us on a cool day. I think about everything that we're probably going to experience on this low humidity, nice, warm day. Those are the things that are lovely. I think about the lovely things of God. I think about the blessings he has brought my life. I think about my family. I think about my wife. When we focus on those things, it evokes something within us. It evokes something within us, and it begins to change. Things that are admirable or good report, or praiseworthy, or appealing, whatever is worthy, whatever's, whatever's of, you know, again, these are self-explanatory. What, you know, um, he's talking about our deeds and our thoughts that, that by their very nature move people in admiration and praise. Virtuous or excellent, whatever's excellent. Think about those things. Whatever is worthy of praise. God himself, I, just this, is, this last one, considering this last one for a minute, whatever is worth our praise, whatever is worthy of praise, you want to start changing something that is happening in your heart, praise and worship. You know, praise and worship is, yes, there, there's, there's a significant setting of, of praise and worship being um, in the church. And, and I know that, that praise and worship or worshiping God is also a decision that you make with your human body, and, and, you know, giving to him and serving him. It's not just about singing songs. It's about giving money. It's about, you know, sacrificing your life and serving him and, and responding to his goodness and doing what he asks of you. That is definitely worship. But there is a vocal part of of praise. When you don't know how to praise God, read scripture. Find things that declare his personality, declare who he is, that define his, his love and his beauty and his glory, and begin to praise God that way. You know, not seeking a self-centered song just because we want to feel better. Nothing personal. 
because I know that I do. I just want to feel better, so I'm going to find a song that makes me feel better. No, no, I'm talking about praising God and considering the things that make him great. When you put him at the focal point of your life, it will begin to change everything within your heart. It will begin to change everything about what's inside of you, what's happening here. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It alerts your attention. And you know what? Man, you're driving down the road, put some songs in, and who cares how foolish you look to the car next to you? I mean, just sing it out. There are moments in my life where I have a lot more moments than, yeah. There are moments in my life where I've got up in the morning and I'm like, oh, I can't do this today. (laughs) All right? Not today. I can't adult. I want to go back to bed. I don't want to address this. I don't want to have to deal with people. I don't want to have to deal with situations. I don't want to have to deal with my own kids. I love you guys. I'm sorry. All right? I'm sure they wake up sometimes and think I don't want to have to deal with my dad. Anyway, um, not really because I'm perfect. I mean, let's be real here. Um, why are you laughing at me like it's funny? <laughs> But, but no, I, I, get into the, I, get, I get into this mode, like I get up and I'm like, okay, I, I'm, I'm moving through my day, I'm going you know, to work out in the morning, so I'm going to get myself in a place where I'm just like, where energy is, is increasing, and, and I put my um, headphones in and I start listening to music that just uplifts my soul, music that brings my attention to Christ. Music that, that makes me focus on God, and it begins to change the, the, the position of my heart. I can get in my vehicle and start heading towards work. Um, Grace and I can attest to this a, a bunch of different times. We both love to sing, so we could be driving down the road singing. And then other times I'm like, Grace, just let the musician sing, okay? We don't have to have backup singers, <laughs> all right? Um, but... But no, like you're going, you're going about your business, you're doing your thing, and you're just like, you're singing songs, and it's like so fun, and it's so exhilarating, and it just uplifts your heart, just makes you feel better, because, because you're, you're refocusing your attention on Christ, you're refocusing on his glory, you're refocusing on his goodness, in Luke 6, 30, or 43 through 45, again, I, I just, I want to keep reading scripture because I just, I want to point out the fact that this is something that is addressed a lot, the, the heart itself. And in, in Luke chapter 6, Jesus takes on some more things that have to do with the heart. And this is what he says, a tree and its fruit. It says, no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. We read this in weeks past, but each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not get figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good, not talking about the ice cream, the good man brings good things. Um, I really love briars ice cream. I don't even know what that was about. See, out of, out of the heart, I'm thinking of glorious things that I'm hopefully going to be able to eat later. Anyway, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You have moments. I have moments where it just comes spilling out and you're like, I didn't know where they came from. No, 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 that, 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 you know, flood that's been existing within you, the dam just broke and it just went, it just came flooding out. And you're like, ah, I don't know where it came from. I don't know where, no, I know where it came from. The filter that you've been putting on for so long, that, that tight, you know, that, that, that strengthened fortress that you were hoping would hold in your words, that ugly face you've been making because you didn't want to say something, all right, finally lets loose and something comes out and you're just like, oh, I, I, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I uttered those words. Why? And why does this happen? Because there may be bad fruit that exists within us. We may be producing bad fruit. You ever bite into a piece of fruit that is rot? It, it is awful. You ever come across some fruit that's rancid? 
that smells disgusting or an apple that you pick up and your thumb goes right through it and it's all mushy in your hands and you're just like, oh, get it off, get it off, get it off. You're like wiping your hand on the grass and you're like trying to get it away from you, right? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what Jesus is talking about. It, it, it's, there's something that, that's within you. That's within you. At the same time, though, and the goodness exists within you. If, if, if God's love exists within you, if you think about those things and you dwell on those things that we were talking about earlier, you dwell on the scripture, you dwell on praising God, if you, if you dwell on his glory, that means that something so succulent, so tasteful, so delicious, so wonderful is going to come out of the phrases and the words and the statements that you've made. I have been in places before where I have experienced the juice of a fruit that is just perfect enough. It's just like, wow, that was good, right? I've been there before. Can you imagine if the words that you speak are consistently that sweet, are consistently something that others want to consume? It's like we were talking about last week. What you speak, you, the, the things that, the seed that exists in your life, when you speak it, you can scatter seed into the life of another. What you say, you impart. What you say, you impart. And so when you speak, are people going to feel the bitterness and grotesque um, rot of, of fruit that is, that is bad for them and bad for their system? Or are they going to experience something so lovely and fresh and awakening. Three things, real quick. Evaluate, meditate, punctuate. Okay? Evaluate, meditate, punctuate. You gotta evaluate. If you're gonna deal with what's in here, you gotta evaluate what you're allowing to come in here. If you're gonna deal with what's in your heart, you gotta evaluate. What am I watching? What am I listening to? Who am I listening to? What people am I surrounding myself with? What are they leading me toward? How are they affecting me? How are they infecting me? You know, like, like how are the, we've got to evaluate. We've got to make some serious evaluations. You know, we can find ourselves captivated by social media feeds and suddenly stuck on Facebook for so long that the opinions, the ideas, and the thoughts of others that we're reading become the ideas, opinions, and thoughts that we accept. We've got to evaluate. Not only do we got to evaluate what we're allowing to come within us, we've got to evaluate what exists within us. By God's grace and his help through his Holy Spirit, we got to begin to evaluate. Is this good or is this bad? Do I need to have heart surgery or not? Do I need to deal with this? Do I need to ask God to come inside of my heart and with a precious and kind and loving like a surgeon begin to separate things that are caustic and dangerous and awful to my existence and to my heart and begin to deal with them? Why? Because we have got to deal with those things. If we're going to say things that that are beautiful and lovely, if our words are not going to be the sticks and stones that break and wound and devastate, we need to evaluate what we're taking in and what already exists within. We've got to meditate. Meditate, meditate. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. You know, the Bible is the answer for so many things. The Bible is the answer for everything. What's, what's captured in the Bible leads you closer to God. What's captured in the Bible reminds you of who Jesus is. What's captured in the Bible, you know, just, just conjures greatness of the Holy Spirit within you. What's captured in the Bible, we've got to meditate on it. We've got to think about it. We've got to consider it. We've got to memorize it. We've got to allow it to, to just, you know, exist. Like, read a, a Bible verse and just chew on it throughout the day. Like, read something and just allow it to affect you all day long. Meditate, meditate, meditate. Think about it. Don't be afraid to, yes, read other things, but, like, you could read a whole chapter of Scripture. And at the end of it, you're like, okay, there's some cool stuff that came out of that. You know, that, that was good. Um, you know, but then the next day, you're like, I just feel like there's more I can learn there. I just feel like there's more value that I'm not getting out of that chapter. So I'm going to read it again, and I'm going to read it again. 
because there's something significant there. There's something special there. Now, I know that there are hot spots in the Bible that we want to often travel to because they, they just bring us excitement. They make us feel better. Yes, celebrate those things, but really begin to dive in and chew on everything that's written there. The Bible it declares itself as living, as living. And it'll make you alive. Meditate, meditate, meditate. Don't just come to church on Sundays and that be the only time that you hear the scripture. You are absolutely, totally, and completely losing opportunity to experience so much. And punctuate. We've got to stress. We've got to emphasize. We've got to single out what's important. We've got to single out what's important. We've got to punctuate our lives, okay? So we've got to evaluate, yes, we've got to meditate, but, but we've also got to punctuate. Like, how is this reality, how is this evaluation and this meditation going to change something about me? How is it going to exist within me? How is it going to, if, if you look at literature in, in the area of punctuation, you punctuate sentences to give the reader additional information, all right? It's where the sentence ends or where the sentence shifts. It, it ch changes whether a sentence is a question or just a statement. It changes so much about understanding the thing that you're reading. It just it, it, it gives you um, clarity. It gives you direction for how to read that and how to understand that. And so when you think about those things... When you begin to punctuate, like, how is your life changing? What are you stress stressing? What are you emphasizing? What are you singling out as important? How are you going to evaluate, meditate, and punctuate? How are you going to do those things? I had this written um, in my message. I just put it here in the, in the PowerPoint there towards the end. But during the, the prayer that the board members um, pray for my wife and I before church, church service starts. And this verse was referenced, but in Ezekiel 36, 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. Now, if you look in the context of the book of Ezekiel, you will find out that God's chosen, God's people were drifting far, far away. They were making a mess of their lives. They were hardening their heart towards God. They were separating themselves and getting farther and farther and farther away. And this truth, this reality, this promise of Ezekiel, it just comes right out there. And God is saying, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will remove that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I have met some people. I've experienced in my own lives moments where my heart was stone, where it was just hard, that there was no penetrating it. That it was, you know, that, that, that we meet, encounter people, that we ourselves have moments in our lives where we just feel like we are a stone, that we are rock hard, and that there's nothing that's going to change us. But God promises a heart of flesh. Now, I love this because it references the gospel. He's not talking about a cleanup plan. He's not talking about some, you know, some housekeeping. And I understand that that goes along the way after resurrection in Christ and we're born again and our lives are changed. But here in Ezekiel, he doesn't say, I'm going to do some upkeep. He says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, a new heart. Some of us, we feel so broken and so devastated and so messed up that we feel like our hearts will never be fixed, that it will never be better, that it will never improve. You get through life's journeys, you go through life's challenges, you go through life's horrors, and you're like, okay, this is where I am, this is what's going on, my heart is too broken. And Jesus is saying to us, Jesus is saying to us, look, I've got a new one. It's yours. I've got a heart transplant right here. And this one's alive. This one's full of the spirit. This one's flesh. This one's, this one's beating strong and healthy and full of hope. It's full of who I am. I know that every human being is in need of a new heart because our heart is wicked and deceitful and, and broken. 
It's okay to say that. It's okay to experience that. And we've got to say, we've got to say to ourselves this morning, will I allow God to give me a new heart and a new spirit? Will I allow that hardness to be extracted and that newness of his glory and his wonder to be, to be put in? What is your heart full of? That's, that's my final question to you. What is your heart full of? What is your heart full of? And that's what we've got to ask ourselves today. If your words are going to make a difference, and I reiterate this over and over again, church, your words are a reflection of Christ, and they are born of the gospel. And so... Your words at the core of who they are, your words at the core of what they are, should always be born of the truth of who Jesus is. Always. 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 And so what is your heart full of? What is your heart full of? What is within you? Yep. The Lord wants to give you a new heart. No, that's good. The Lord wants to give you a new heart and a new spirit. Will you let him? Jesus, I thank you for today. I thank you for truth. I thank you, God, for pointing us to these words. I thank you, Jesus, for pointing out in our lives, even when we have outward eloquence and wonderful ideas about your law and about how to live as a Christian, that you deal with, you address what's going on within us, and you help us to root out the bitterness, the hatred, the awful things that exist within our hearts. And I pray, Father, right now that that Ezekiel promise would become a promise that we attest to. That in our hardness, we would find you and we would ask you, Jesus, give me a new heart. And that heart would beat. And that heart would beat with life and hope and confidence and trust. That that heart would beat with love. That that heart would be beating with the truth of you, Christ, and the promise of your gospel.